Luke is a serial entrepreneur with strong roots in the early Agile community. So the Agile is not new for him. Uh, and in, in recent years, he also contributed to the Scaled Agile framework with a strong focus on lean portfolio management and Agile uh, product management. And one of the topics, particip participatory budgeting, I really love this word. Um, he also introduced this uh, approach this participatory budgeting, um, this democratic uh, budgeting process to many private and public organizations, including cities like how to spend the city budget. And uh, now with his new startup, Tilliden, he brings this budgeting approach to schools to teach children financial literacy so um it's, it's roughly a two-step process so first teach the kids the power of money and then rewrite the rules of school funding and uh, in his talk he will summarize how he applies safe in the startup environment and uh, the importance of core concepts uh, core patterns and where he um, um, where he needs to adapt for this uh, specific new context so um have fun um, with his talk and uh, don't forget uh, to visit uh, the tilliton Til tilliton website at tilliton.com because there's a very strong story behind it so look it's your stage thank you so much i am so happy to be here uh and i thank everyone um i promise you that your english is better than my german so <laughs> uh, given that i know don't know any german um uh, i'm really thankful that i can speak uh in in english and we'll we'll get our way through this i'd like to add that uh you can ask anything you want in the chat and if we don't have time to answer it in the talk we will answer it uh, in an email that I'll get to the organizers that will get to you. So feel free to ask anything you want and, and, and it's, it's okay. Well, just a little bit about me. I am a serial entrepreneur. My last company, Contenio, was acquired by Scaled Agile. Now we're working uh, on Tilladin. I've also formed a nonprofit, Every Voice Engaged Foundation, which uh, works on um, improving civic engagement. And my Agile community roots is I helped form the Agile, the first Agile conference in 2003, and I've served on the board of the Agile Alliance, and I've done extensive work with the Scrum Alliance and Play Camp and Product Camp, and written a few books. Um, uh, so, so I've tried to make some contributions over the over the years, um, but I'm really focused now on bringing uh, participatory budgeting or PB because uh, participatory budgeting is hard to say. So we often just say PB. I'm now bringing PB into schools. So let's talk about a startup. What, you know, what makes a good startup? You know, what's a good start to a startup? Well, you want a compelling problem with a sufficiently large market to justify working on it. You need to have desirability, viability, feasibility, and sustainability in the solution that you bring. You need to have a caring and competent team. Startups are hard work. And I think that that it's not just technical competence. You, you don't wanna burn people out. You, you wanna care for them. You actually have to have a pinch of humility, but you have to have a kilo of crazy because it it's, can be crazy to leave the safe world that you're in or the, or, or the comfortable world that you're in and do something in the, in the bold brand new world. So you, you need a pinch of humility, but a kilo of crazy. So what, what's Tilladin's answers to these? Well, our compelling problem is finding, uh, fighting financial inequality. If you look um, globally, right, it's, and it's around the world, uh, the more unequal our societies, the worse a society performs on health and social uh, outcomes. And so um, in the United States, we're among the world's most unequal societies, and we have a lot of these problems, but it's, it's not just the U.S. Now, we need a desirable, viable, feasible, and sustainable solution. We get that with participatory budgeting. Um, um, oh, and I said ad. <laughs> this should be app, not ad. I must have had the spell checker on, and I forgot to catch it. So this is an app. We're building an app. 
We have a caring and competent team. I think I'm both caring and competent along with my leaders. I, I think I have a little bit of humility and I definitely have a kilo of crazy. If anyone in the agile community remembers innovation games, when I started it, everyone said no one will play games and it's a terrible name and it doesn't work. And now a decade later, Speedboat is one of the world's uh, speedboat and sailboat is one of the world's most well recognized retrospective techniques. Uh, we've got prune the product tree. Uh, we've got uh, buy a feature and participatory budgeting. So I'm comfortable uh, with my level of crazy. Now, how do we build a startup? Well, you, you definitely want to understand your customers and eventually you want to collaborate with them, which means I'm going to be using design thinking but I have to make sure I've got the money to justify uh, the new business. I need to understand my customers so I can plan my releases. Um, I need to understand the market events and market rhythms and leverage all of the work that I do in, in safe road mapping about organizing my work. I'm a startup, so I have no architectural runway. Um, at Tilladin, we spent the first three months doing nothing more than building architectural runway. And I'll talk about that later in the deck. I need to experiment because I'm not entirely sure what's going to work. So I want to use the lean startup processes and methods. Well, hey, isn't all of that in SAFE? I mean, if you if you look at where SAFE is and you look at the overview, the customer is dead center of SAFE. Everything we do in SAFE is about the customer. Everything that SAFE is about, it's not about building faster, it's about serving the customer. So you can take all of these and map this into, you know, the safe, like built-in quality and an architectural runway and understanding how I'm going to have my continuous delivery pipeline and developing on cadence and releasing on demand using design thinking, wait a minute, it's right here in safe. So all of these techniques and even more are in safe. The challenge of course, is that safe has things that a startup doesn't need. So a startup doesn't need enterprise solution delivery. A startup doesn't need quite the same lean agile leadership structures because we're starting, we're not transforming. So I do want to have the mindset and principles, but I don't need the roadmap because I'm not transforming, I'm starting. So we want to take the best parts of safe and blend it into a startup safe. Now, the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to start uh, with the portfolio configuration of safe. And I want to remind people that safe isn't a monolith. It has specific configurations that are designed for specific needs. Now, essential configuration or essential safe doesn't include portfolio management. And as a startup, I do need to make choices about how I'm going to invest and manage my portfolio. I don't have a large solution yet. And I don't need the full configuration because I don't have the complexities of multiple um, uh, portfolios. So the, the, the configuration of safe that works best for a startup is in fact portfolio safe. Now, what am I going to keep? What am I going to change? And what am I going to earn? Well, I'm going to keep the business model canvas or the lean canvas. I'm going to keep my strategic themes. I need a way to do estimation. So I'm going to keep the epic estimation, I definitely want the lean startup cycle of safe. I definitely want to understand market events and market rhythms. So I'm going to keep all of these things. Now, I'm going to change a few things about uh, portfolio safe. Portfolio safe is, is based on the idea that there's an enterprise and the enterprise may have one or it may have many portfolios. If you only have one portfolio for the enterprise as a startup would, then the portfolio vision becomes the company vision. So I'm going to change the, the vision uh, notion to not portfolio vision, but just the company vision. I'm going to drop the portfolio canvas because I only have one solution. So my business model canvas or my lean canvas will be the only canvas I need. And the reason I say earn this is 
Uh, the purpose of the portfolio canvas is to enable an organization that has multiple solutions to manage those solutions in the portfolio. So if I'm a startup, I don't start with multiple solutions. I start with a focused solution. I can earn more solutions if my startup is successful. And as I earn more solutions, I would use the, um, uh, the uh, um, portfolio canvas. And that's the same thing with investment by horizons. In investment by horizons, I'm, I'm basing this on multiple solutions, but I only have one solution. And by definition, it's a horizon three solution in a startup. So I don't need an investment by uh, horizons. I earn it if I'm successful. Now, the other things I'm gonna change are, I'm gonna keep my a strategic portfolio review, but again, it's not the portfolio that I'm reviewing, it's the entire company's budget at the, at the level of the leadership team. And I'm gonna change uh, participatory budgeting to include uh, stakeholders within the organization but again, it, it tends to be not the portfolio budget, but it's the actual entire company budget. Now, what I wanna do next is I wanna go a few slides into some of the things that I've just talked about. Now, an area that I didn't list above because it's so important is that as a startup, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go out and hire a bunch of employees right off the bat. I really wanna start with a flexibility um, model so I can add staff, add resources quickly, at, which means I'm gonna use a managed investment contract from SAFE. I'm gonna start with a partner I know and trust, and I'm gonna give them a fair commitment. Now, I'm working with a, a team that I've worked with in the past. They're a group of developers located in um, Mexico. And what we get, did was we created a six month contract uh, with a rolling six month commitment. We established this cadence that works, but because everything is new, including the team, I changed our iteration to one week iterations. And the idea is with a one week iteration, we're explicitly not giving the team much time to get work done, but that means that we increase our communication. Now over time, we will move to two week iterations, but when we're starting, we're gonna go smaller. And then this is in Steve Maynard's video on agile contracts, right? And the agile contracts article, but we educate, educate, educate. As a team, we watched all of the safe agile software engineering videos. I taught them, um, I taught the team that I'm working with, uh, I walked them through our pitch deck. I, I, I I gave them everything in our pitch deck. We even did our own internal PB process so they could experience PB. So this notion in the managed investment contract of creating a strong relationship with your um, uh, supplier is really critical. And you know what, I, I, commit, I trained them in SAFE. I made sure they know <clears throat> the program mission, but the program mission was the company pitch deck. So they've been through our pitch decks and they've been through our processes. Now, the next thing that I wanna focus on is agile product delivery. And this is this customer centric approach to defining, building and releasing a continuous flow of value. So this is where we put a lot of effort into a startup. It, and a startup is in, in safe terms, it's about 80% agile product delivery 10% portfolio management and 10% leadership. I mean, we're really putting our effort into the APD. So let's look at what's going on. Lots of stuff we keep. There's a tremendous amount of stuff. We keep our Simon Sinek vision from the Agile product management class. We keep the Agile um, or the value proposition canvas. We invest in our DevOps. We understand customer journey maps. We use story maps. We use a Kanban system with a continuous integration pipeline, and we invest a ton in our architectural runway. Now, what we change is we change the notion of desirable, viable, feasible, and sustainable. In this case, we're building a new product or service, so the viability is the business model itself. We're testing a lot of things. I also change things a lot in the, in, in the personas. Um, I think the, the safe model of personas is fantastic. Um, however, in a startup, 
um, you typically know less about your customers. And so you want to use your market research uh, to really develop your personas um, um, and from first principles. We're also going to change the notion of a program increment because I don't have this starting condition. I just have a bunch of ideas and I'm going to lead them in. And so I'm going to talk about how we changed the uh, iterations in the program increment. What I'm going to add is um, <clears throat> Before we have a journey map and a story map, we have a story. So I love comics. And what I often do in my startups is we build comics of how our customers are interacting, or how our personas, right? So we, we take our personas and we add comics. And those comics are drawn by our graphic arts team so that we really have a story about how people are using our new app. And the thing that we uh, uh, that Safe is silent on is specifically usability testing. Um, it's part of uh, Safe uh, continuous exploration, but it's not really called out in the framework, right? So what we've added into our practice is we do a ton, an absolute uh, ton of usability testing, um, checking our story and checking our um, uh, app. Now let's dig into some of these a little bit more. Before a story map, there is a story. So one of our um, uh, personas is uh, Laura Stonehouse, and she's a teacher in a school. And you can see, and I know it's a little hard to read because uh, the font's small, but you can see that you know this. Uh, we've got a scenario, we've got a user story, but now we've got an entire flow that drives people through just like a comic book. And we've got several of these stories it, that drive our story maps and our customer experience maps. Now, the other thing that we do a little differently is that in user testing, there's this tension between testing the vision and building things out. So what, what we do is we distinguish between the vision and the iteration. Now, this is a screenshot of a tool called Figma. So Figma is a tool that our designers used for designing the user interface. Now, Please read this carefully. The, the, the vision is what we design and test against, and it's way more than needed for an iteration. And for those of you who are worried, it could be considered big upfront design, but I really do need to test the workflow and test the vision. Now, and therefore, I am accepting that it's inducing a bit of risk. But this, this part in red is in an iteration. And what you can see what the designers do in the iteration is they add a whole bunch of detail about workflow and state application management and state flow. So we scale back the vision and provide a lighter weight, but yet more detailed iteration designs. Now, of course, sometimes these designs will change the vision because the implementation is where the actual developers will go to the designers and say, you wanted us to you wanted us to do something that looked like X, and we had to change it a little bit. So so we're going to update the vision, and this back and forth um, it, to me is a really solid uh, uh, agility. What we end up with in this process is a, a beautiful app because you've got designers who are usability testing and developers who are implementing it. So we you know this is how the kids using our app create ideas and develop those proposals. This is how the kids vote and fund in terms of the participatory budgeting. It's a very different experience than what you would see in a professional market. And you can see it's been optimized for kids and how they work. And it's just, it's just gorgeous. Now, when you have no solution, everything you're doing is architectural runway. And when you're starting from scratch, you need to think about your Uber architecture. I wrote about Uber architectures all the way back in 2002 in my book, Beyond Software Architecture. And back then in 2002, the two main Uber architectures were LAMP. If anyone in the phone call remembers LAMP, that was Linux, Apache, MySQL and PHP or um, Microsoft, where you you know build out a heavy app in the Microsoft stack. In the cloud world, 
there's several cloud architectures, but there's really a few that have started to stand out. There's the Google, the Google Cloud Platform, there's Microsoft Azure, and there's Amazon Web Services, and, and the, the front end to Amazon is Heroku. Um, these are all great platforms, right? Google Platform, Microsoft Azure, Amazon, you know, AWS, and Heroku, these are all fantastic. We actually chose Heroku because the dev team that I was working with had experience with Heroku. So part of our experience was, or our, our choice was based on experience, and that's not surprising. What I would say is the, the point of having an Uber architecture is once you've adopted the Uber architecture, you shouldn't complain about how the architecture works. You want to just simply use the services it gives you. So at Amazon, for example, we're using the image recognition service to check the images that are uploaded by the kids. Um, um, you, and you, and you, you, for example, in your messaging, you might use something like Kafka because Kafka is built into Amazon Web Services. So what you want to do in the Uber architecture as a startup is let the Uber architecture do as much work as you can. Now, I believe that big companies need to adopt this. One of the things that I find when I'm working with big companies and they say to me, Luke, how come Silicon Valley companies work faster than my, you know, my insurance company or my big company. And many times the reason is because they have many different architectures. Whereas in Silicon Valley, you know, Google has one architecture. Facebook has one architecture. Apple has one architecture, right? You're, you're, you're limiting your choices so that your architectural runway is, is supporting features across all of your development teams, all of your organization. Now, you have to add the rest and you need to trust your experience. So when we were building out our app, these are all of the things that we started in the first three months. We built a fully localized app that was cross-platform. So we're using Flutter on our front end. So now we have an app. We have something that works on uh, websites. It's responsive design. We've invested in a gorgeous UI. We've got an API model. We explored REST and GraphQL. We're using GraphQL. We worked on our architecture. We've got an event sourced architecture. We made sure that we were using patterns to drive our data. And of course, we made sure that the choices we were making in our architecture were right from day one, GDPR compliant, which I'm sure is, is in Europe, you know what GDPR is, but FERPA in America and CCPI are American uh, regulations. So, so we baked this in all as architectural runway. So now every feature I add gets all of these capabilities. Now, we don't have a PI zero, but we did a lot before we did our first uh, set of iterations. Now, we're building for our first release. And after that, we'll move into a normal PI cadence. But what are the things that I did to really help my team start well? Well, I helped them understand the problem domain. I made sure they understood the company mission. We chose the Uber architecture. We invested in the data model and spiked it. We designed the vision UX and then we spiked it to make sure we could do it. We designed the API and we spiked it. So we did a lot of pre-work. So now the team is doing their one week iterations and they're, they're pushing bits every week and sometimes multiple times a week using our CICD pipeline. Now, I am a huge believer in patterns, not just architectural patterns, but especially data model patterns. Um, one of the books I love is David Hay's book of, of Enterprise Model Patterns, and he talks about organizational structures. So we took this pattern and we adapted it to our needs in, in serving schools. So one of the things that you want to look at is, is part of your Uber architecture. Um, and whenever you're doing anything new, you really want to be pattern driven. We also added custom state diagrams and state models so the team knew the flows and the operations through the system. And we invested a lot in understanding the state diagram and, uh, so that we could be successful. Now, there's a few more notes, and then I'll have time for Q&A. Um, startups aren't always easy. Um, I know in the Agile community, we talk about sunk costs, 
But in reality, it's not the sunk cost that's the problem, it's the sunk emotion. It's, it's how we feel about things. So we actually started with React and we had some real problems doing what we wanted to do with React. And after a month of work, we decided to try Flutter and it worked great. But that was an investment of an entire month that I kind of lost as a CEO. And that doesn't seem like much, but when you're a startup, that's, that's an entire month that you've, in, in a sense, invested in learning, and that's expensive. We did explore REST, but then we chose Graph, and we even found that we have to change the name of our company, and I'll explain that in a little bit. And just as a joke, but it's true, even our first logo gear, all of our mugs that we ordered to celebrate our new company came in broken. <laughs> so, 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 so even our mugs were broken, right? Um, and our first release to our students was um, incomplete. There's a process of creating proposals and voting on them, but we actually released our software where the students could only create proposals and voting isn't even finished. So there's a bit of gutsiness to putting your software out there when you're not you know, ready. But boy, startups are sure are fun. I don't know if anyone on the phone call has worked on a startup or smaller company. Um, uh, we know our work matters. We know the students are loving what we're doing. We're in we're in early pilots and we're planning pilots around the world. We're learning and growing and we're really thankful that we've got safe because now I don't have to invent stuff. I don't have to invent like the right way to do something. I can just go pull it off the shelf and use safe to understand. And this is how our worth, our, this is how we know our work matters. There's a book written called The Spirit Level, which looked at, income inequality and health and social problems. And you can see German, Germany actually scores pretty well um, in terms of this index. Uh, the Nordic countries do really well. The US, uh, the US where I live is, is by far the worst. So there, there's a, to me, for my children, for the children of America and for the children of the world, um, this work really does matter. And, and creating ways to, to create a more equitable and in, in uh, society is really critical to us and, and, and it drives our work. Now, I said we had to change our name. Um, uh, I, I've learned, I think that there's a German opiate with one L, uh, Tilladin, um, and there's some other issues with the name. So we're rebranding uh, to First Root. So this is what you're gonna see um, in a few weeks when you hit our website. Instead of Tilladin, you're gonna see First Root. Um, thank you so much, and, and I'm hopeful that we have a few minutes that we can invest as a team in um, Q&A, if anyone put any in the chat. Um, uh, I, I've turned my video on, so hopefully, uh, uh, Felix, we can see each other and talk, um, but uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Luke. Wow, thank you very much. Yeah, so you really touched uh, a lot of um, your difficult topics and did some 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 deep dives because you really need need to have some experience to see the challenges you were talking about actually. Um, so something which uh, automatically automatically comes to to uh, to my mind is uh, you say you are going to start or you you are you started in um, um, startup. And why not just using a Scrum or a Kanban-based mm -hmm. method? So why are you? Why did you decide to to uh, draw from from the Safe framework and uh, implement quite a lot of the practices described in Safe? Well, let's say you're a startup, and uh, I mean, ask yourself the following question: Let's just say you're a startup and you're going to use Kanban. Okay, that sounds great. I, we're using Kanban and SAFE is a Kanban system. I mean, people sometimes forget that SAFE has Kanbans at the portfolio, at the program and at the team level. But what are you gonna actually build, right? What are you gonna put into, you know, if, if you take the simplest possible version of a Kanban system and there's to do, doing and done as your three columns, what is the team going to put in the to do column? Well. Presumably, it's going to put some features that need to be built. Okay, then you ask yourself, well, how do I know what features to build? Well, I go talk with customers. Well, that's market research and that's continuous exploration. So even if you 
don't claim you're doing safe. You are doing a safe practice called continuous exploration because you have to figure out what to build. And Scrum, Scrum, uh, I'm not antagonistic on Scrum. Scrum is fine. Scrum says that the product owner is supposed to build the backlog. How exactly is this product owner supposed to build the backlog in a startup? They have no feedback from existing customers because they don't have existing customers. So what are they going to do? They they have to use design thinking. So, you know what 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 you're going to find is if you if you say I want to do a startup and I'm going to start with Scrum or Kanban, you're going to add in a whole bunch of practices. And the whole point of safe is then rather than figuring out and guessing what practices you should add, safe makes it easy. It says start with agile product delivery and add the practices that are going to be feeding your backlog the right thing. Add design thinking, add customer journey mapping, add personas, add empathy interviews, the things that we teach in agile uh, product management. So I, I think it's fine to say our processes is um, uh, uh, Kanban, but you're still going to add in all those design thinking and customer centric practices of, of agile product delivery to, to figure out what to build. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's kind of eye-opening, actually, um, to see what you did, because uh, it, you know, at least to me, it wouldn't sound obvious at all to use something like the scaled agile framework to, uh, you know, to use in a startup. So I totally understand uh, um, Felix's question. question here, um, but it uh, it's an eye-opener to see that what's actually behind the scaled agile framework that it's especially the agile part that's uh, important that can be used in any size. Um, so I think that's really, uh, yeah, eye-opening. And um, I think maybe you should uh, go ahead and create some sort of a manual for startups to use SAFE because once they're, uh, they understand the systems and uh, all the ideas and the mindset and everything behind it, they can actually start scaling from there and you have something that's to start point. with. By the way, my friend Harry Kahneman, who's on the framework team, and he's a great guy. Um, you know, I know I know Felix knows Harry. He's he's wonderful. Yeah. I sent him this deck to review before the talk, and his he had only one feedback. He's like, "Dude, you put all this stuff in safe." I'm <laughs> like, "Yeah, I <laughs> I put it all in there for a reason." Because because Harry and I had a talk one time about startup safe. I said we need a configuration of safe called Startup Safe. Because to your point, this gives startups who are wanting to scale a clear path of consistency. It's super exciting to me. Yeah, maybe you should consider um, a, something, a little bit of a rename, uh, scaling uh, Agile framework, uh, because scale sounds so definite you know it's it's it yeah. has to be large to be scaled but uh actually you just showed that uh, the framework is scaling with you and your needs that's the goal the goal would be you know in my you know my intention and i did this in my last company right i told dean um you know at Contenio, we did so many things that safe advocated and then we added these other things and now And now I, I don't speak for the company, right? I'm not an official representative of, of Scaled Agile in any way, but you can easily see through this conversation that, wait a minute, if I was a startup and I started with Agile product delivery and lean portfolio management, as my company becomes more successful, for example, if I needed, if my solution became more complex or more sophisticated, um, I pick Airbnb, right? Because they're about to go public, right? And it's a, it's an easy American story, right? They didn't start with the the thousands of developers that they have right now. They started with one team. But wouldn't it have been nice if you had the same principles and practices? And for the person who asked about Kanban, you know, we have a team Kanban. Now we add the program Kanban. When we're ready, we add the portfolio Kanban. Like you have consistency. Um, there's there's a question from from the chat from Florian Merz and he's asking has this really been an agile scaling or only quotation marks a huge scrum team so maybe you can elaborate on that so oh, where you are have... now and where you want to be in in the future yeah I don't have a huge scrum team I, maybe I don't understand the question um, we only have one dev team. Um, um, Now we're distributed in three locations around the world, 
Um, but we only have one dev team. So there's not a huge scrum team. It's just a regular agile team. Um, I'm not sure if that's, if I, if that's the right, if I'm answering the question. I, I think behind the question is, uh, is that uh, most people say uh, safe is about coordinating teams and uh, they don't see uh, at the first step the, the value by, uh, provided by all the other uh, practices described uh, in safe. They mm -hmm. just focus on this uh, um, coordination of a lot of teams and No, I get that. And, and, and I understand that. Um, so, so if you actually go in the history of SAFE, you'll find that the first version of SAFE, SAFE 2.0, started with three teams. It evolved into starting with five teams. So now the current configuration of SAFE kind of says an art is five Agile teams or more, right? But if you actually go in the history of, of, of SAFE, like SAFE 2.0, it was three teams or more. And I just pushed that number to one team. So... So, you know, and, and again, imagine that you're, 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 you're a straight scrum shop and you start a startup with one scrum team. What happens when you add your second scrum team? Well, now you're stuck because scrum really doesn't define inter-team operability. It does have some guidance on, you know, there's one product backlog, but it's not super clear how those teams interoperate. So there's no notion of a PI. There's no notion of a program board. There's no notion of understanding and communicating, you know, you know, architectural runway investments for the teams. So for me, um, you know, have you know, having an art with one team. And honestly, I think Keegan has been doing some um, really brilliant thinking in this regard, Felix. Right? You guys talk about microservice architectures. And and the evolution, and I'm I'm you know how much I support the work that you guys are doing with microservices, and you know if, if a microservice has eight teams, it's not a microservice, right? So so right, that's just another art, right? But it, but if I have my solution comprised of microservices, and my microservices are built by one or two, and maybe at most three teams. It's the same principle. So you know I know that Keegan is doing some really interesting work about. Um, uh, microservice-based architectures in the context of SAFE. And I'm totally down with that. I totally support that. Yeah. Florian just um, um, answered to that that said, uh, yeah, that's the right answer. So you pick the cherries of SAFE, but not for the scaling, in uh, his opinion. But I think maybe it's not um, what we just said before. The scaling might you know, still be true at some point as you uh, grow. Um, you can just keep on doing what you did, but not the scaled, as we have said before, right? Bingo. That's the right way to say it. It's scaling, not scaled. <laughs> and it's aspirational, right? I mean, the mm. goal, I mean, you know, Keegan wants to continue to grow and, and I want to continue to grow. Like, it, like, it, 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 and wouldn't it, it's just, wouldn't it be nice to have something that you know will be ready for you when you're ready for it. Like, that's one of the things I, I find I love about SAFE. Like, you know, I don't need a big HR thing for my teams because I've got one team and I'm investing in it. But imagine I've, you know, Tilladin becomes, uh, or First Root becomes successful and we have, you know, 50 Agile teams organized in, you know, two portfolios. Wouldn't it be nice to know that there's, uh, there's, there's guidance about, leadership and and helping the organization have you know what's the agile leadership mindset because now i need middle management right i can't get that big without middle management wouldn't it be nice to have consistency to me that's the exciting thing that safe gives us we it it, it gives us that ability to have something that is a is growth and destination so the only thing you'd be getting rid of is the transformation roadmap because you didn't need it you started with it yeah, I, I, I also see the value in, in SAFE uh, that it provides a taxonomy or a shared language where we can have uh, serious conversations and then uh, figure out how to uh, tackle the challenges which we face at the moment. But if you don't share the same language, uh, you, your chances are quite bad. Yeah, I think that language thing is really important. Um, um, you know, just just talking about the different things that we do in safe that are so the, the, the language of the ritual, right. And, and is, is so useful. A again, I, I get one thing for free that that other people may or may not be asking about. And what I get for free is I don't have to transform. Right. I, so, so mm -hmm. like I said, the, the one, the only thing that I truly think you chuck 
or throw out is um, uh, the transformation roadmap because you don't need the transformation. It's, uh, it's almost like to your point of, about what, what do we want to write about? We want to say start here and here's your scaling roadmap. A scaling roadmap is not the same as a transformation roadmap. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, since we're unfortunately a bit of a, a tight schedule, I would really uh, invite you to open up a session in Hopin and um, anyone who would like to join and uh, talk about Tilladen, excuse me, first route. Yeah, um, no, I, mean, I, I, made I think it would be great. Exactly. great. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just going to leave with, it is so, I'm so happy to see my friends smiling faces. Gosh, I miss y'all. And, and uh, I mean, you know how much love I have for this community. Agile, overall but also you know uh, you know yeah i am the weird agilist i i'm a geek but i say words like love and things like that so yeah. it was great meeting you thank you so much and keep up your good humor even as a startup uh wow <laughs> thank you oh, Luke. look at see the mugs eventually the cicd pipeline works <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you good luck all the best bye see you Bye, Luke. Bye-bye. <laughs>